What's up, guys? I'm recording now. This is Tuesday. We're back from break, and we have pretty much two months left. If you check this link I posted, it's a calendar. It's not new, but it's useful. And if you look, if you scroll down to April, here's today. We got a normal week. Next week, we have e-learning at the end. And then it alternates between, you know, full week and then one e-learning. Full week, one e-learning. All the way to the end where you have the last day on uh, Thursday. So uh, two months, eight weeks, and it's unlikely that that's going to change. We're not going to have any snow days or anything like that. Take a look at the link if you're curious. Also, one thing I'm supposed to remind everybody of is the uh, themed days for... Homecoming, next week you got pajama, pride, jersey, quarantine, red and white, but that day's an e-learning. And then at the end of the week, there's the homecoming stuff. You probably heard about that in Impact, but uh, we're all reiterating it just in case. Now, in this class, we're going to have a small assignment today, which is going to be covering some poetry. So last time, just to recap... Last time we had uh, our CQA in quarter three, and then we had two little assignments in quarter four. I'm reminding you because it's been a couple weeks, you know. And one was, hey, I showed some videos, and I said, let's work on describing those videos. What do you see? They were action scenes, so they had fighting, and uh, usually they had cool music and colors and actions and all this stuff. And I just asked for two things, the sights and the sounds. Those are uh, obviously important in poetry, but they're important in everything. When you write a story, you're going to need a good amount of that stuff too. And this quarter, we're going to focus on those little things. Less of the big character, plot, motivation stuff, but more of the little, what's the right word, what's the right rhythm, that kind of thing. And if you haven't done that, you can do it now. The next assignment was a photo. We went outside uh, fairly shortly because it was super cold. Hang on. What's up? Thank you. And we said we'll take a photo and write a couple lines describing it. Here's my... Uh, example, I said, here's some photos that I took one time. If they ever load, yeah, here we go. And you could do something like that. You could do something totally different. If you were at home, you could take a picture of something. But I do want it to be a picture that you take and not just like a, you know, wallpaper you find online. And I said, write a couple lines. Again, I didn't say write a poem because I want to keep this... Uh, stress-free and low, uh, you know, I don't want to have you internally criticizing everything before you even type it down. But here's some tips I gave. Single lines, don't worry about a story. Uh, verbs are the key thing. You always want to have a good juicy verb that contains all the info. You don't just want to say it is and then you do the work with adjectives and adverbs. You want to have the verb like you know, carry its weight. And then you can use uh, personification and you can use all these literary devices you learn about in English class in order to uh, give a verb some pizzazz. Okay, if you just say something is there, that's kind of bland. But if you say like, oh, it hides, well, then that gives us, that gives us some intention. That gives us some personality, or you say it looms, that means, oh, it's big and imposing. And, uh, it's going to come in later. It's almost like some foreshadowing, you know. Um, you can say what it wants, even if it doesn't really want anything, even if it's just a cigarette butt on the sidewalk. Um, end of the line is the key thing. You want to make the end of the line have your nice keywords. You don't want it to be some boring word like of me with or something like that. You want the end of the line to be nice. And I got some of those turned in, but not a lot. So today, even though I give a short assignment, it will be a day to catch up on these first two things for quarter four. But today, let's get to our assignment. 
and it is I'm gonna read some poems they are very short so I'll take 30 seconds each but then I'm gonna ask you a little bit of questions about it so I'm gonna give you the two Google Docs as well okay I'm gonna to try to give variety so maybe each day I'll do like one old poem and one new poem or something like that and here's the first one it's very short I probably have it memorized. I could probably do it with my eyes closed. I don't know. And this poem, we're not going to get into much of the author bio or anything like that, but I'll give you the year and the name. It's 1939. And the guy is American. And the guy's name is Brewster Gieselin. Gieselin? I'm not sure about the last name. I've only seen it in books, but now I'm curious. I want to find out. So let's read this poem because I think it does a great job of illustrating a few key uh, concepts. I found him sleepy in the heat and dust of a gopher burrow, coiled in loose folds upon silence in a pit of the noonday hillside. I saw the wedged bulge of the head hard as a fist. I remembered his delicate ways, the mouth, the cat's mouth, yawning. I crushed him deep in dust, and heard the loud seethe of life and the dead beads of the tail fade as wind fades from the wild grain of the hill. What do you think? That's the first poem we've looked at in this class. And we've read stories, but this is a different thing. It tells a story. It has a beginning, middle, and end. Where the narrator sees a snake, observes it, connects it to other things, and goes on a little reverie of like, oh, what, what does it remind me of? What is it like? And then I crushed him deep in dust. After that stanza break, after that cut, it feels extra snappy. It comes out of nowhere, and that's the real action of the poem, right? One thing you'll notice right away, and that makes a poem different than a story, is that it has no need to say why. It doesn't say because blah 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 I crushed him deep in dust. We don't care. That's not what it's about. It's about what's happening. What does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it feel like? That kind of stuff is what we're talking about. If you saw a painting of this, for example, it wouldn't say, well, here's why the guy's doing it. It's just a different type of thing. Now, I'm going to give you one thing to look for. This is not the master key that unlocks all the poetry. It's just one little tip that is super uh, universal. Okay, And I learned this when I saw this poem in a book. Uh, it's a book called The Triggering Town that I would recommend. It's a lot, I think I have it on my shelf here. Um, but what it says is this. Stanza one, right here. We got a lot of longer, slow words of two or three syllables. Okay, I found him sleepy, gopher, burrow, silence, noonday, hillside, remember. Okay, so these are nice, slow, thoughtful words. And in English, pretty much anything over one syllable is a slower, more uh, contemplative word. It's probably from Greek or Latin. It's probably a little more uh, official and academic and medical sounding. But stanza two, every single thing, one syllable each. And those words are punchy. They're simple. They're usually from Old English instead of uh, Southern Europe. And they feel more like, you know, honest, hardworking, down-home farm words. They feel like action and not thought. So one thing to keep in mind if you're reading a poem or writing a poem is that when you want something to be slow and thoughtful, you might go with the longer words, two or three or four syllables. If you go longer than that, then it's kind of, you know, it feels like an academic paper and not art. But 
if you want something to be punchy and physical and immediate, you probably want to go with your single syllable guys. Okay, it's not a rule. You don't have to do that every time, but it's a nice uh, pattern that fits a lot. Okay. Next. Well, before we do that, does anybody have any observation or anything? Yes. Yes. In fact, that's going to be the assignment. Next class is to uh, is to write a poem. Uh, and, and you can, one of the options will be to take one of your things that, like the description of the movie scene or the description of the photo, will be to take one of those and turn it into an official first draft, or you can start with something new. Um, but I wanted to sh actually read some uh, first. The question, if you couldn't hear, was will we be reading or writing a poem? And of course, we will. So that was one, and that's one style, but there's a lot of different types of poetry if you go to different times and places and different uh, sort of schools of thought. So I wanted to get another one. And like I said, every day we'll do a couple, maybe one old and one new and so on. This is from 2007, so it's a, a bit newer. Uh, what, like 80 years newer than the other one? And uh, it's by a woman instead of a man. It's still American and it's still about sort of one physical thing. So you had rattlesnake. This one's about, or from the perspective of, a windmill. So let's, re let's read this one and see what you guys think. A windmill makes a statement by Kate Marvin. You think I like to stand all day, all night, all any kind of light to be subject only to wind? You are right. If seasons undo me, you are my season, and you are the light making off with its reflection as my stainless steel fins spin. On lawns, on lawns we stand, we windmills make a statement. We turn air, churn air, turning always on, waiting for your season. There is no lover more lover than the air. You care, you care as you twist my arms round till my songs become popsicle and I wing out radiance of light all across suburban lawns. You are right, churning is for you. For you are right, no one but you I spin for all night, all day, restless for your sight to pass across the lawn, tease grasses, because I so like how you lay above me, how I hovered beneath you, and we learn some other way to say, there you are. You strip the cut, Splice it to strips, you mill the wind, you scissor the air into ecstasy until all on shimmer with your bluest energy. What do you think about that one? It's a tiny bit longer. It felt like he definitely used the way, you know, it's structured longer. He used that a lot more apparent to get his point across. It wasn't as, it was more obvious than the last one. Um... What do you mean? By the way, well, she, not he. Oh, she, okay. Well, the last poem, it was a lot shorter, obviously. Mm -hmm. And without it, he or she, they, whatever. Yeah, now, there's always the thing about um, the speaker might not be the same as the author. So maybe the author is male, but is writing from the perspective of a female, or, or this perspective of a cloud, or whatever else. But, um, you know, as a default, we usually just say, he if the author's male and she if the author's female. Well, the shorter one, you know, you had a lot less time to pack stuff in. So I got a feeling okay. that got across those points a lot better and you know, a lot more structured than he did, than these people did. It kind of threw a bunch of things together. And it worked. You know, it all makes sense. It's very direct, but it doesn't really leave anything up to your interpretation. Okay. I think one difference, and this is a bit longer, uh, it's more lines, but each line is a bit longer too. And one difference is that this poem, this second poem, has a lot of repetition where, you know, I'm doing this, and that makes sense because it's about a windmill, and a windmill goes around, and so you're, uh, two seconds later, you're back to where you were, you know, and you're uh, moving circularly. But this poem has a rhyme, and then another one pretty quickly, even before you expect it, so you've got night, light, right, Seasons, seasons, you know, um, 
the rhymes traditionally when we think of a poem we think of the end of a line will match the end of the next line but um, this one is like three words later there's another rhyme and it really um, makes you feel the rhythm of it and feel the um, timing you know like when you read a Dr. Seuss book there's no question about how to read it you know exactly what the timing is because of the syllables in the rhyme and you know exactly how to say you know I do not like them Sam I am everybody knows to stress the do in that even though it's not underlined it's just built in and so on this one when you're like we turn air churn air turning always on waiting for your season um, I can't imagine delivering that any other way it's just built into the uh, cadence of how you might stress it and how you might slow down in one part and speed up in another part. And that's a big reason why I chose this as one of our first examples, because if you're looking for those uh, classic literary devices you see in a textbook, this has a ton of alliteration. This has a ton of internal rhyme. This has a ton of uh, assonance, which is when you repeat vowel sounds. Uh, how alliteration is consonant sounds and so I, I don't want to make this video super long I'm still recording by the way um, I'm, my question for you guys is okay I gave uh, two poems and they're pretty different and what do you notice in them and this could be anything it could be the uh, sound is there alliteration something about the rhythm, something about the length of the lines or the length of the phrases or the rate at which they uh, bounce off of each other and turn into a new rhyme. Is there something about the verbs, the way it, for example, let me give you one clue, which is verbs that have, I mean, this sounds really obvious, but verbs that have more stuff, they feel slower, they feel longer. Verbs that have an ing, really don't get you that speed if you're like turning, churning, uh, that has a nice medium rhythm to it. But if you say, I crushed, crushed him deep in dust in the rattlesnake poem, that's one syllable, ends on a pretty tough uh, consonant, and it feels faster, right? If you said, I was crushing him deep in dust, and it's like, ah, we're in the middle of it, it's not done, it's not fast. Um, the length of words can make a huge difference, especially when you're going from one to two syllables. That's doubling. You know, if you're going from six to seven, that's not a huge thing. Give me a couple observations you have about these poems, and it could be anything. Like I said, this is a pretty um, light introductory assignment. I'm not looking for you to use uh, the Greek terminology and say, oh, well, the author uses anaphora in line 13 or something. I just want you to say, uh, well, I noticed this one has a lot of rhymes and they come faster than you think and they come in a different rhythm. Or this one has a lot of uh, like physical description and the other one has more about the thought. Or this one has longer lines and it makes you go longer breaths. Or, hey, this one ends lines in the middle and the other one always ends lines at the end. Uh, whatever you think of observing the craft, observing how it's put on the page, you know, not what the author thought or what kind of person the author is. We don't care about that. We care about what is actually on the page and how does it affect things. For example, this one has some italics. What's going on with that? Um, you might think it's a certain voice or a certain style and uh, maybe you can describe it. So I'll end the video before it gets too long and I'll say that I'm going to post these two poems and this video and the question is what can you observe about these two poems how do they uh, differ from each other or from other poems you've seen or from what you've expected and how can they uh, maybe how can they inspire us to do something of our own